Hi, and welcome to YDN Multimedia. Tonight we're here with Richard Valeriani, an NBC correspondent with the White House for about 30 years, who's going to share with us some, about his, some of his experiences in the industry of journalism. Welcome tonight. Thank you, it's good to be here. Back at the old alma mater. Um, first, I would like to cover a little bit, uh, get a little bit of a preview of your lecture tonight. Thanks. You're going to be speaking about the influence of technology, smartphones, blogs, et cetera, and journalism. So, could you tell me a little bit about your opinions on how smartphones, blogs, social media have decreased, perhaps, the emphasis in in-depth, accurate news? Uh, they've increased it considerably because there is this mass of information, if that's what it is, that's being poured into cyberspace with no editorial filter. And so anybody can come on and say anything. And there tends to be still, maybe not with your generation, um, a certain weight that's given to the written word even though it's on the internet. If you see it in print, it must be so, is sort of the idea. And so there's been a proliferation of, not only of these smartphones and devices, but cable. Cable is the same thing. The product has been diluted. And my starting point tonight is that the major, the mainstream media has lost the trust of a majority of Americans. One poll showed that 60% of Americans do not believe what they read in their newspapers, what they see on television, what they hear on the radio. That is three in five Americans. That's bad for the country, it's bad for democracy. Absolutely, and then how do you think journalism, you say that right now there is this massive distrust, so how do you think journalism can emerge from this technology internet revolution being a credible, accurate, unbiased institution? That's the $64 million or 64 byte question. Uh, we're in an evolution. It's not a trend, it's an evolution. And so, as you put it, a revolution. We're st the revolution is ongoing. So we really can't determine what to do about it, really, until it's over, if indeed it's going to be over. There is no magic bullet. There is no quick fix. It all is going to end up with you, the reader, you, the viewer, you, the listener. You are going to have to distinguish among the various outlets to determine which ones you can trust, which people you can trust, which reporter you can trust. There is no other solution right now. There is no mass solution. It's fascinating. And then you, having such an incredibly important role in coverage of the White House over the last 30 years, how do you think that this revolution, the social media, the blogs, have influenced the pres presidential elections and the media's coverage of them? Again, it's still evolving. Now, this time around, for I think for the first time, the uh, Obama campaign understood the value of social media and really got it out there. If you look at the youth vote, youth vote broke very big for Obama, even though everybody was saying, oh, he's not gonna get it again. They've lost their enthusiasm since 2008. They went after that in the social media. The Romney folks were a little old fuddy-duddy about that and it paid off. So it, it is now gonna be a, a really important part of every, not only presidential campaign, of anybody's campaign if they wanna win. Absolutely true. Um, yesterday in an interview with Charlie Rose, Tom Brokaw decried the dilution of the presidency's power. Um, he said, and I'm paraphrasing here, that at the beginning of his career when the president was giving a big primetime speech, the nation would just sit down and listen. But nowadays it's not true anymore. Do you agree with him, and if so, why? I don't, I don't agree with the, the, the concept of the dilution of power. First of all, it varies from president to president. And one reason you can say this about the current president, President Obama, I have never, in all the time that I spent in Washington, seen such an obstructionist Congress. You know, Harry Truman ran against the do-nothing Congress. This was also a do-nothing Congress, but with, with vituperation, with malice. So I don't necessarily agree with that. However, he's, uh, Brokaw is right about another thing, which is the press has become much more aggressive, starting with Vietnam and then Watergate. In the old days, the press was sort of complacent in dealing with the government. Uh, but then came water, uh, Vietnam with the government lying to us day after day, then Watergate, more lies. And so the press said, let's take, let's take the gloves off. And now we live in what I call gotcha journalism. If you look at the coverage of, say, say Clinton versus Kennedy, enormous difference because of the change in the zeitgeist. That's, yeah, I, I absolutely understand the trend that you're pointing out. Um, 
actually, this is a good segue to my next question, which is that objectivity in journalism. Some might even call it extreme objectivity in journalism, even in t times where you might question that. You shared in an interview with Mary Moore an incredible anecdote about your conversation with Henry Kissinger, um, where you, um, some might call it riled up a foreign diplomat during negotiations. Some might call that extreme, but in your view, why is that important and how should it translate into everyday journalism, even perhaps here on a student campus? Well, what happened there was very simple. Uh, they called us in, Kissinger was meeting with Sadat, and they called the, the camera guys and the media in for a, quote, a picture. Well, no self-respecting journalist is going to have a crack at Sadat without asking a question. And so Kissinger, you could see him sort of, oh my God. Um, and so we just bombarded them with questions, which ticked him off. They were, they were legitimate questions, mm -hmm. but Kissinger didn't, didn't want them answered because they would be transmitted instantly to Israel before he had a chance to interpret what he wanted. So that was the real problem of it. Plus the fact that Kissinger didn't always understand the media very well. I told him once, uh, uh, meeting on the plane, I said, Mr. Secretary, we as Americans, there were, we, we generally 13, I used to call us the Kissinger 13. We're in the back of the plane, perhaps we're in the back of the plane rooting for you to succeed. But as journalists, we don't care whether you succeed or fail. And he looked at me as though I'd hit him in between the eyes with a hammer. He said, how can you? I said, that's our job. We're not here as cheerleaders, we're here as reporters. Now, you can argue that we can't be completely objective. Remember, we're a human being, I have feeling. An executive editor at the Washington Post when he held, held that position, stopped voting. He said, if I vote, it compromises my objectivity. Now, I think that is really extreme. But the way I put it is, that's part of my professionalism, to be as objective as I can. And the way I put it is, if you go see your proctologist or your gynecologist in the afternoon, and then you see him at a dinner party that night, you hope he treats you differently. And so, that's the way we are. No matter what my feelings are, I, as, a, as a reporter, professional reporter, I try to keep those feelings out of my work, my copy. Now, you may say, okay, you can't be completely objective. Okay, I'll accept that. But I can always be fair. There is no reason not to be fair, and there is no reason not to be accurate. You know, Joseph Pulitzer's three principles of journalism were, one, accuracy, two, accuracy, three, accuracy. And I'm afraid that journalism today, in general, has lost that, that obsession with accuracy. This is really great, um, because I'm about to ask you about credible journalism and why people should care about journalism being accurate and credible in today's society. Um, I think a lot of students right now are really into this blogging, social media, you know, like the student as the journalist type of thing. Why should we really, really, to put it bluntly, care about that accurate, in-depth coverage that you think has been lost? Because it is the only place to get it. We have lost trust in almost all of our institution, institutions. The, pre, uh, the presidency, as Brokaw pointed out, um, Congress, you know, what the, you know what the approval rating for Congress is? Nine percent. Even the Supreme Court. Approval rating for the Supreme Court is under 50 percent. Look at the Catholic Church. Millions of Catholics no longer have any faith, really, in, in that institution. So this has happened uh, across the board. Uh, now, as you say, you want to say, what can we do about it? Well, again, it comes down, devolves upon the individual to, to figure out uh, whom you can trust. That's why it's really important that you have a reliable, accurate press, because there's no other place you're going to get it. Great. As a journalist, I love that. <laughs>